Sa lupa lava, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. Olo ingo o Susana Suiswiki. Coming up, there's no let up in PNG's fuel shortage woes. Also, bilingualism in Sacred Islands Māori in English is has a whole lot of educational and social and wider advantages. Cook Islands Māori language is declining as English dominates. And later, a lot of collisions, a lot of physicality up front. Manu Samo and Nikali Tahi battle it out on the rugby pitch. Issues with the availability of fuel in Papua New Guinea don't appear to be easing. It's the result of a major fuel importer, Puma Energy, being limited in its access to foreign exchange. Since the beginning of the year, there have been intermittent shortages. In an order last week from the country's police chief and pandemic controller, David Manning, that the central bank and Puma sort out the issues seems to have come to nothing. Don Wiseman asked our PNG correspondent Scott Wyde about the impact of the shortages on the ordinary people of PNG. The impacts are wide ranging, and the more obvious impact of it is the airlines, how it's affecting travellers. Whenever there's a, a notice from Puma Energy saying that we will be rationing fuel, there's always a notice from New Guinea saying that uh, New Guinea can't carry on with its flights because there's a restriction from Puma Energy. So it, it puts hundreds, of, you know, sometimes thousands of people at a disadvantage because they're just about to travel. They've woken up in the morning. They are looking to travel that day. And then the notice comes out. I'm not talking about notices that come out days in advance. No, it's like a few hours just before boarding time that notice comes out. For example, just before the day when the French president arrived, we, we had another, another notice like that. For example, there was a workshop being run in Port Mosby and we had two staff who were supposed to leave the next day. So they received the notice from Air New Guinea saying that there'll be fuel rationing. Air New Guinea has cancelled its flights indefinitely. That was at night and they were supposed to fly at six o'clock in the morning. So it put them at so much of a disadvantage. They had to reorganize their hotels. They reorganized transport, everything else, and then eventually found out that they could travel, but much, much later in the afternoon when they sorted out Puma Energy and the central bank sorted their, their issues out. And what happens if you're between trips, if you're halfway through a trip? I've seen uh, instances where Passengers have been really frustrated because they, they're transiting and then Puma Energy releases a statement, Air New Guinea follows up with another, and the passengers vent their frustrations at the ground staff. And it's it's not their fault, it's not the ground staff fault that flights have been cancelled, but because they're a representative of Air New Guinea, they're representatives of Air New Guinea, they, they get the brunt of the frustrations from travelling passengers. Does the airline put people up in hotels if they're stranded? Yeah, they usually do. There are some passengers that don't get that privilege of having been accommodated by the airlines. And that's where the frustration is because you, you're dealing with multiple flights and, and it complicates the, the situation at the hotels as well because they've got their own guests booked in and then Air New Guinea has its preferences, sending guests to the hotels for them to be accommodated. So it has a domino effect on everything. And what's the situation in terms of land transport? In terms of land transport, especially in Port Mosby where there's a lot of traffic, you, you have long queues uh, at the Bowsers on all over the city and, and people, you know, sometimes they run out of fuel uh, and then people start looking for the next service station to go and refuel. So the lines can be extremely long. They clog up the traffic. Uh, you can be sitting there for at least one, two hours just waiting to, to refuel only to be told that we've run out of petrol. So you can maybe check the next one down the road. So situations like that, it's driven up costs for businesses. So you've got manufacturing businesses, you've got retail businesses, large shopping malls that have to run off generator power because there's fuel shortages. They have to plan for the next few months in case there are shortages. The situation's not made any better with constant blackouts by PNG Power. Yes, now we know this comes back to issues over Puma not being able to get enough foreign exchange and this is because the central bank is keeping tight rein on foreign exchange because it doesn't want the Kina to lose value. I understand that's the plan. Do we have any indication that attitudes are changing? I, I don't see 
an immediate solution to it now, maybe not, not in the next few months, because the prime minister has issued, issued statements saying, look, sort this out because it's affecting the country. Then you've got David Manning going one step further, issuing directives to the central bank and Puma as the pandemic controller saying you need to fix this because it's affecting everything else. So I don't see that uh, situation resolving itself over the next few months. It may continue for the next 12 months, maybe, and, and most probably until Papua New Guinea has, has a few mines up and running. Te reo Māori Cookie Airani, or the Cook Islands Māori language, is at risk of disappearing as more Cook Islanders shift their preference from their native tongue to English. According to the UNESCO Oceania Endangered Languages, Cookie Airani is decreasing at an accelerating pace. With more Cook Islanders living abroad, particularly in Aotearoa, which is home to more than 80% of the entire population, the Ministry of Pacific People says only 9% can speak Cookie Airani. Ahorangi or Professor Stephen May from the School of Māori and Indigenous Education at the University of Auckland says New Zealand has a constitutional and political commitment to try and maintain the language. Rachel Nath spoke to Professor May who sheds light on the current language landscape. Uh, kia ora, uh, Rachel. I think the key issue around Te Reo in uh, New Zealand is that it's continuing to decrease uh, from generation to generation. So in the approximately 80,000 uh, Cook Islands Māori uh, within New Zealand, um, fewer and fewer are actually um, passing on that language to their children, and that's one of the key challenges. That's why at the moment currently only 9% or so of those um, 80,000 actually continue to speak the language. And we see that trend particularly uh, in relation to younger people. So only 7% of those under 15 speak the language. So you can see that it diminishes as um, as the age uh, gets younger. And that's that makes it very challenging to maintain a language if young people uh, aren't speaking it, if parents aren't passing it on to their children. So what are the broader challenges faced by Cook Islands Māori in Aotearoa? The broader challenge is, of course, that part of the reason why Cook Islands Māori is facing significant language shift is that the majority of Cook Islands Māori population actually live here in Aotearoa. So 80,000 or so live here, 28,000 or so live in Australia, and of course in the Cook Islands itself, only around 17,000. So 82% of the total population live here, and that's in an English language dominant context um, with very little bilingual education uh, provision at the moment and often in the home uh, a lack of awareness of how to maintain the language. So Cook Islands Māori Language Week is a really important way of focusing and um, showcasing the language but we also need to get out to parents, to caregivers uh, and to schools the importance of maintaining Cook Islands Māori alongside English uh, for all of the reasons that I've just talked about. So. Given the Cook Islands Māori population in Aotearoa, would the government have a greater responsibility towards preservation? Cook Islands Māori have been New Zealand citizens since 1949, and Cook Islands Māori language uh, is a language in the realm of New Zealand. And so we have, I think, to a certain extent, a constitutional and a political commitment to trying to maintain the language, but not just for cultural reasons, although they're really significant, as I've said, but also because uh, maintaining uh, or establishing bilingualism in, say, Cook Islands Māori and English is, has a whole lot of educational and social and wider advantages. So it's, a, it's also a message to government uh, that, you know, we have an increasingly multi-ethnic population in Aotearoa, uh, in Auckland, Tamaki Makaurau, we have over 160 languages spoken, and yet English continues to, dom- to dominate in pretty much every language domain. And so how can we rethink that and, be- and see ourselves as being more bilingual, more multilingual? Uh, and certainly there's a, an obligation, I think, but also um, an opportunity to extend that in relation to Cook Islands Māori alongside other Pacific languages. So if I could just navigate our focus to preservation here, what needs to be done to preserve this language? Well, I think there are two ways specifically. If we look firstly at the home, then one of the key variables that's been identified for some time now in the research is the impact of intermarriage, uh, particularly if one of the parents is not a Kokan Māori speaker. 
and what tends to happen in countries like Aotearoa, which are English language language dominant, uh, that often if there's only one parent, they switch to English with their children. And that explains why we're getting this increased language loss for Cook Islands Māori. So the key challenge, if there are Cook Island, speaker, uh, Cook Island Māori speakers in the family, is for at least one of them to continue to speak uh, to their children in Cook Islands Māori, uh, even if the other parent doesn't or the other caregiver doesn't. So one of the key things is to maintain that usage within the home. We call it more broadly family language policy or family language planning. And then the other uh, way, obviously, which is through education, and that remains challenging as well in the Aotearoa context, because we have very few meaningful bilingual edu education options uh, for Cook Islands Māori. And we know that high levels of bilingual education or immersion education, uh, which are levels one or two in the New Zealand context, so either 80% and above for level one or 50% and above for level two, uh, if those programs were established and expanded, then that would be another key way in which we could strengthen the use of Cook Islands Māori and Aotearoa. And what is the current education framework? Currently we have, as I understand it, still only one level two program throughout the country and most of the other programs that do exist at the primary level are level three and four programs, so below 50%. So they are useful in the sense that they provide some language awareness and some cultural grounding, but all of the national and international literature tells us that we should have at least 50% uh, medium of instruction in Cook Islands Māori uh, for it to be an effective bilingual program. So the challenge is to try and establish more high-level immersion, level one and level two programs for Cook Islands Māori and Aotearoa, and that hasn't happened as yet. Hmm. So would would the onus then be upon the community? Yes, I think so. A combination of the community and the and the school system. So we saw last year, for example, in Mangere, uh, Ta'i Tamati Tiranga Rangatera Centre open, which is a full immersion early childhood um, centre, and the first of its kind uh, for Te Reo And um, that's a very positive development. And that came from, I think, a combination of community pressure or community engagement, community advocacy, uh, and then that program was established uh, and supported at the time by the um, Minister of Pacific um, uh, People. So that's a, a clear example where community pressure, community activism, uh, and related to schooling um, can actually make a real difference. The challenge now is to extend that into the primary sector. And we have models for that, of course, Māori Medium, gives us a very good model, but we do have some very strong Pacific bilingual programs, predominantly Samoan with some Tongan, uh, but there are already existing models within schools in Aotearoa of strong bilingual programs that are either level one immersion programs or level two, at least 50%. And so we could model off those as well. Mm. And now what would be the significance of preserving and promoting Cook Islands Māori? Well, language is always linked to culture, and so there's no reason why we shouldn't maintain a language. One of the key challenges that a lot of uh, minority languages, including Pacific languages, face is the presumption, particularly among parents, that because they're in an English language dominant context like Aotearoa, that their children must learn English, and no one's, uh, no one's contesting that. But what often happens is that English is learned at the expense of other languages specifically, and that's not necessary because bilingualism is an educational, social, cognitive advantage in any combination of languages. So you could maintain knowledge and use of Cook Islands Māori uh, for cultural reasons, but also just for instrumental reasons, because uh, learning a language, being bilingual, all of the research over the last 60 years shows that being bilingual in any combination of languages is an advantage. And that's the message that I think we need to get across very clearly to parents, uh, particularly uh, in terms of their family language policies, you know, how do they, how do they maintain the language within the home if one of the parents does speak Cook Islands Māori. And that's also the message we need to get out to schools, that effective forms of bilingual education, which have been clearly evident and trialled and uh, with lots of support in Māori medium, but also in Samoan and to a lesser extent Tongan Pacific bilingual programmes, they're highly successful. Uh, so why don't we extend that to Cook Islands Māori? 
The Pacific Nations Cup 2023 series wraps up on Saturday with two test matches that serves as the last Rugby World Cup selections for the Pacific's three top rugby playing nations. All indications are the two matches, which will see Manu Samo host the Ikale Tahi of Donga at Apia Park and the Flying Fijians battling Japan in Tokyo, will be tough tests for the Pacific Three. Elisa Tora is in Apia. He spoke with Ikale Tahi head coach Toutai Kefu at Apia Park on Friday as Tonga rounded off their preparation for Saturday's Polynesian rugby battle. Tomorrow's game, last one for the Pacific Nations Cup, important one as you build towards uh, the World Cup. Uh, what are your thoughts on the class against Manu Samoa tomorrow? Oh, look, it's going to be a it's going to be a, a real tough game for us, but we're looking forward to it. We're well prepared. We're we're a little bit desperate. Hey, we haven't won. We lost the last two, and we haven't won a game yet. So we'd love to go into France uh, with a with a win. Your your lineup that uh, you've named. Uh, we don't see any Israel Folau uh, again. Uh, what is the story with uh, Izzy? Yeah, he has to have a knee operation next week. So uh, he's gone back to Brisbane. He'll have a knee operation. Hopefully be right by the World Cup. Sam Lousy also injured with an ankle. Um, Ogi uh, Bulu also injured with a calf strain. So three key players. Um, but, you know, that's part of the game. We, we move on. Okay. Coming out of uh, Japan... Uh, looking back at that game and looking at uh, Manu Samoa, uh, what do you think uh, it's going to be? It's been, well, tough travel for us. Um, the preparation's been good considering all the travel. We've only really had the one training session yesterday, um, so it's going to be a challenge for us, but um, it's a good good challenge for the boys. Um, you know, we're, like I said, we're desperate to win and we're going to try and do as much as we can to try and uh, get the win. Some of the good things you've seen so far? Set piece has been outstanding for us. Um, it's we've ha- held we we know that it has to be a focus for us moving into the World Cup, and we need to hold those standards. So that's been very pleasing. The Tongan captain Sonatani Taklu expects another tough physical class for his 51st test. It's going to be a tough game, like physical t- uh, um, match tomorrow. As it always been when we. When Tonga and Samoa play, so um, like Kev said, yeah, we've been doing really well in our set piece, so um, we're going to go in with a confidence tomorrow and, and, um, and just try, um, you know, throw the ball around and, and stick to our game plan. 51st test tomorrow, uh, Sontani. Uh, history for Ikaletahi uh, as a player. What are your thoughts? Uh, um, it's an honour and it's a, it's a blessing to, you know, to... Make uh, 50 or uh, 51 match for my country, and I'm uh, and I'm always grateful for the, for the opportunity I get I got to to put on the jersey. Salmon captain Michael Alalatini playing his first game against Tonga says their work is cut out for them. A lot of collisions, a lot of physicality up front, and and um, you know with their firepower at the backs, you know we've, we've got our work cut out for us, but it's it's, it's an exciting challenge. Uh, one that we're looking forward to tomorrow. Meanwhile, the Flying Fijians, who are two from two and leading the tournament so far, are expecting a stronger challenge from a Japanese side that has shown consistency in their two test matches so far. Uh, they're a very high quality team and they've, they've shown that over the last couple of cycles at the World Cup. They're getting better and better. Um, I think they play at a very high tempo, very fit, very organised, um, very clinical in their, in their contact areas. Uh, ever improving in their set piece as well so it's going to bring a unique set of challenges for us uh, this weekend so it's a it's a good match for us and our preparation to see where we're at where we are at as well all three teams are rugby world cup bound and they are expected to name their squads for paris in the next week that's pacific waves for today don't forget you can listen back on rnzi.com slash programs we're also on apple spotify and iHeartRadio radio podcasts from myself and the team here at RNZ Pacific, to fast we fall.